Tape 6, Saturday, 7 p.m., Bill Stafford, Conference 224. I don't know whenever I have been blessed as much with singing as I have this week. I'm telling you, even Brother Sonny sounds good. Amen. Oh, oh amen. <laughs> amen. I really appreciate it. I, I really loved Brother Sonny until... Uh, you know, I used to sing a little till I heard Sonny, and uh, but I, but he used to go into houses where my records would be, and he'd move mine to the back and put his on the front, and tell those people that I have to give them away to get rid of them. And I had never forgiven him. I don't think I ever will. Amen. But uh, it was really, but it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But I, I did quit singing after a few folks asked me why I kept on. And uh, so uh, over in the tape room, over in the, there's tapes and albums over in room number six. Is that room number six, I see? That's, huh? That, no, that last one. got six on it. That's the number of man. Boy, look, couldn't we put something better? Five, number of grace. It'll take a lot of grace to sell what's in there. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, uh, Sonny's got a... Uh, I'm, I'm making a commercial for him. And uh, Amen. And uh, he can't sell them records in there. And he's offering them six for $15. Is that right? Six for 15 I mean, boy, some of those albums are something. So, and y'all ought to buy them. Do what, brother? No, 15 records for $6. Amen. I knew better than to get started in this in this thing, but uh, do do go in and look things over in there, and uh, even I brought some tapes this time. Of you know, I just figured maybe I had something to say you might need to hear. But anyway, they're over there, and the uh, cassette of the month, whatever you'd like to have in there, just go take a look. And uh, Sunday, I didn't do too good, buddy, but uh, whatever you sell, don't. But don't forget what you promised me. If, amen. <laughs> <laughs> amen. <laughs> Oh, boy, listen, folks, I'm going to tell you something. We might as well have a good time. Might as well have fun. I mean, if I can't have fun being a Christian, I'll just go get drunk, you know, just anything. Amen? I mean, anything's better than being a dead Baptist. Right? I mean, God God got me before Baptist did, and that helped a lot. Amen? And I'm going to have a good time. And I, I can be a Baptist and have a good time. Amen? I don't have to change horses in the middle of the stream. I can, I can just praise God and love Jesus, shout the victory. Amen. And I'm going to do it. But I thank you. Thank you for the singing, for blessing my heart, and for, for just getting to be here in this meeting. And I'm getting blessed. I am really getting blessed. In Joshua chapter 7, the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua, and uh, I'm preaching that on the dangers of revival. And pray the Spirit of God to speak to us tonight. I know the messages have been heavy and God's really been speaking to us and uh, seem like we never understand how to continue on in our walk with God. And uh, in the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua, they're in Canaan, which is a type of the spirit-filled life. They're in that life of abundance. They're in the life of promise. They're where Moses could never lead the people. They had made two crossings now. They've crossed the Red Sea, which was a mighty miracle. And now they've crossed Jordan. I never shall forget down through the years. I remember them singing that old song, I won't have to cross Jordan alone, alone like crossing Jordan was going to heaven. And I'm glad that's not so. Amen. I'm glad that I don't cross Jordan to go to heaven. And crossing Jordan is to get in the spirit-filled life. And when you say spirit-filled life, you're not talking about an ex exhibited life. You're talking about an ex executed life. You're talking about crossing us out. So Christ can be everything. A continual life of making sure that we're reduced so Christ can increase. Bringing me to nothing so He can be everything. I wish we could learn it. We seem to never learn it. The process of God. How He keeps me in spirit-filled living. The, the process, the style, the work of God. Why He does what He does. And ladies and gentlemen, as long as you try to fit God in the way you want God to work, you'll never know what it means to walk with God. And uh, But anyway, in jo Joshua chapter 7, I'm going to read uh, 
beginning at verse, uh, at verse 3, and we'll begin reading. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor there, but for they are but a few. So there went up before, so there went up there of the pe- people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord unto the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over the Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do to thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Why liest thou upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I have commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you have taken away the accursed thing from among you. And he goes on and tells about how they removed and cleansed and got ready to get back with God. I think what we need to understand is that walking with God does not exempt us from failure. The Spirit-filled life gives you no permanent walk with God. A one-time experience of a great moving of God when you're brought into Spirit-filled living does not give you any guarantees forever. It is a life of learning that you walk with God exactly how you got saved. You got saved bankrupt. You got saved helpless. You got saved hopeless. If you're going to walk with God, you're going to have to walk the same way you got saved. Our problem is, we have been told that getting saved solves, gives us the answers, everything's over, and we've got it made. Only your destiny is made. The rest is my choice and your choice. Brother Jimmy said it till the night after I finished preaching, and I think just put a top on what, what I preached, and that was this. It's a matter of choosing to believe God whether I like it or not. You can't walk in the Spirit-filled life in your emotions and your experiences. You must walk in the Word, by the Word, subjected to the Word, and allowing the whole Word to come to bear on your lifestyle. That means every time the Word is preached and something surfaces that's not of God, I must get it right, whether I like it or not. You say, but Brother Bill, somebody else is getting by with it. Nobody ever gets by not yielding to the Word of God. And these people sitting right here tonight that I'm sure you have seen people get by with stuff that you could never get by with. Well, the closer you move into God, the less you can get by with. Amen? And if a man can get by with much, he better check up on his walk with God. I don't know how we can have revival till we just get to this point. Amen? Of just understanding why God has left everything like He has. 
and bringing me to some idea of why God doesn't remove all my problems when he saves me, but leaves enough there to keep me broken before him. The first thing I want you to notice is the matter of pride. The Bible said there is an accursed thing in the camp. Achan had decided, I think I can just sort of steal a little bit of the Babylonian garments and the golden wedge. After all, there's plenty of it, and it won't really matter. You see, his big problem was he was presuming that he was right no matter what God said. You know what presumption is? Presumption is allowing anything in your life that's not of God and yet saying it's right. Presumption is allowing any self-trait that God did not originate, that He's trying to save me from, stay in my life that the Word of God says is wrong. Building me a level of living that can maintain and hold on to that and preserve my sin and still say I'm right with God. Now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. We have built respectable sins. Let me say it again. Okay. We have built respectable sins. Now let me tell you how. And boy, God's worked me over over some of this stuff. I'm telling you, friend, I'm not preaching from just wanting to preach. I'm telling you what God's been doing in my own heart and my own life because I am my own problem. Nobody's my problem but my own personal relationship with God, and you can't stop me from that. Hallelujah. Now listen. For instance, we'll take a person who has committed adultery, run off with another woman, and everybody in the church rises up and says, I can't believe that. You know what I think what to do? Church him. Turn him out. And we do. Bless God, we take him off the road. And yet that same bird wouldn't give a dime to watch a gnat eat a bell of hay and a quarter when he finished. He is so tight and so selfish. Amen. He has never obeyed God in his giving. And he has built him a respectable sin into his life so he can judge everybody else because their sin is worse than his covetousness. Amen. You see, I happen to know probably adultery is not the problem here tonight, but I bet you covetousness would get pretty close. What do you mean? Well, bless God, I just can't give like the Bible says. I, I, after all, you've got to understand the predicament I'm in. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to have my insurance. I've got to have my lifestyle. Uh, man, we're having it tough. Uh, we, we, we're going to have to cut back on groceries. I mean, it's going to cost me. Well, so what? Whatever it costs you to stay with God... He'll be able to bring you to a trust you've never known before if you keep obeying Him when you don't understand it. You see, we got people sitting on church pews that are, that are thieves on God. They will not turn loose. They've got securities. A banker told me the other day, I mean, of one of the biggest banks in this country. You know what he told me? He said, I sit there and watch those people come down and worship their CDs. And I happen to know that in our church, they never give anything. They never get concerned over missions. They're never concerned over needs. They're never concerned over the preacher's salary. They're never concerned over people that come through that need help. They're never concerned. But they're down here looking over their CDs, and they sit there and just watch them grow and just glory in them. He said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And said, then they'll come in church and sit in the choir and sing like a mockingbird, like they love Jesus. What's wrong with them? They'd be the first to vote the preacher out if he run off with a woman. But they stand up there respectable. Some of you are really looking pale. I've never seen you look that sick before. Oh, we're quick to stand up. You see, in Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, If you're going to walk with me, you're going to have to seek those things which are above, not on things on the earth. 
For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Then he turns around and says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And first he starts with sexual sins, immorality, homosexuality, sexual perversion. And then he says, And covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he jumps into sins of disposition and attitude, anger, wrath, malice. And he tells us that all of them are just alike. I mean, when I talk about, listen, if all I ever give is only what I can deduct on my income tax, I'm really giving government money. Boy, did that hit heavy. Well, you know what men say to me? I'm giving everything I can give because that's all I can deduct. The only nation in the world that allows us to deduct income tax deductions is the United States. No other nation lets them do it. We're the only one. And brother, I'm going to tell you something. If my giving is not beyond my deductions, there's something wrong with my giving. Why did I have to preach this? Why can't I be sweet? I didn't used to be like this. You say, why do you preach like this? You ought to preach on heaven. Well, I've seen so many act like they ain't a-going. I'm trying to get them to act like they're going. Amen. Hallelujah. They want me to preach on the second coming. <laughs> That's it. If you're going to clap, clap, bless God. Let her rip. Amen. They, they want you to preach on the second coming, but nobody acts like they really believe he's about to arrive. Amen. What are you saying, preacher? I've had to make up my mind that if I'm going to walk with God, I've got to get my giving beyond what I can get out of it and what I can take away from the government and make my giving a love affair with Jesus. No matter what I can deduct. I got to where now when somebody gets in one of these meetings and don't, and they say, well, I just can't give anymore because, boy, I've got to give all I can deduct. I just want to say, well, when are you going to quit giving the government's money and give some of yours? <laughs> you know how much the offering will be in this, in this meeting unless God gets on it? What we can all figure out we can give of the government's money. But you know what? <laughs> you know what it'll be if we meet God? It'll be such an abundance that Brother Jimmy won't have to mention. It'll be it'll blow our socks off what God can do because we'll give beyond anything that we ever thought that we could do if we get on a faith principle and learn to trust God. Amen. You say you get on giving all the time. It's such a respectable sin. I'm, I think I'll take it easy tonight. I've hollered and hooped. I think we'll let it soak. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we wanting to have fun and we wanting to take it lighthearted. Let me tell you something. I'm serious about what I'm talking about. If they do lift our deductions, and one day they will, then we're going to find out who loves. Amen? You say, what's wrong with us? We're covered with pride. Man, we're tough on that old boy when he gets out there and falls in the pit of awful sin, we call it. That hellish fella. That awful ungodly rascal. But ladies and gentlemen, what's really killing us is that consistent, respectable sin that we leave on the pew, untouched, unconfessed, hidden, golden wedges and Babylonian garments, hid in the tents, covered up. Amen? It's not the big sin of adultery and the big sin of drunkenness and the big sin of murder. It's those little sins that we have swept under the carpet and said, it's not really bad. We all getting by with it. But if we ever have a Holy Ghost revival, we'll spend time getting right with God and right with each other. And we'll never have revival until those little things become big sins. Amen. Miss Bertha Smith said the other day, said, I've got so many books been taken off by preachers. If we ever have revival, I'll have to build a library as they bring them back. For they stole my books. 
Amen. I want to ask you something. What's your respectable sin? What is it that we have swept under the carpet and don't consider too bad? Achan didn't do bad. There was plenty of gold and plenty of garments. The only thing he did, he just did what the Word of God said not to do. That's all he did. Hey, hey, he wasn't a bad fella. He just did what the books... All God did was say, don't do it, and he did it. It's a matter of independence. Acting on your own, presuming that you can get by with it because it don't look bad. I'll, I'll just take it because, after all, it can't be all that bad. There's plenty of gold. God can make some more. I mean, after all, I don't see any reason why I should worry about it. But that's not the issue. God said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And I often tell him in the Garden of Eden, all Adam did was acted independent. He couldn't commit adultery. Only one woman there, and that's his wife. Amen? And he didn't get drunk. He didn't kill anybody. He just did what God said, don't do. Independence. Independence. Hey, preacher, don't preach to me, bless God. I've got my life fixed, and you're not going to bother me, bless God. I, I've got by all these years like this. No, you haven't gotten by you hadn't gotten by. We just hadn't seen enough of the glory to let us know what we've missed. And if the glory of God ever does set down, we will get right with God. Amen. I believe when revival comes that there will be such confession and restitution. I believe it will be amazing at what little bitty things we'll just have to get right with God and right with each other. Just an accursed thing. God said, don't take it. And he said, doesn't matter. You know, he, he, he made up his own mind that he could be God. Right. Amen. I mean, after all, let's look at this thing correctly. I, I think I've got a right to do a few things. We don't have a right to do anything if the Word of God says no. Or if the Word of God says do and we don't do. Right. Amen? So it's a matter of pride. Now, the second thing, after... After that all began to happen, the second thing that happened was that they, they moved from pride to presumption. I've already got on that, but let's look what he did. They sinned in the camp. We've already had two great victories. We've come across the Red Sea. We've come across Jericho. We've seen the walls of Jericho fall down. You've got to admit, we're some pretty powerful fellas. And I don't believe that we need to worry about this thing because we got this thing all together. We got it figured out. We got the program fixed. We got one, two, three, four on how to do it. And I want you to know, bless God, did you see them walls come down at Jericho? We are a pretty powerful bunch. How does God keep me before Him? Only one way. He keeps enough in my life to keep me from thinking I can do it without Him. And but you see, look, look, look at Joshua. First of all, he woke up one morning and had to lead three million Baptists across the Jordan, something Moses couldn't do. Three million Baptist church men. How do you know they were Baptists? Well, they griped for 40 years in the wilderness. <laughs> I've never seen the people that can just nitpick over. Most churches are fussing over something that don't even matter. I mean, griping over little issues. They're fussing over, they're fussing over little bitty issues that don't mean a thing in the world. I think it's about time we get up and charge hell and get in some warfare and win some souls and say, take some territory for God and quit nicking, nitpicking over garbage. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Well, here, he, uh, <laughs> he said, um, just send 3,000 up there. Uh, no, we need many. We're a powerful group, boy. We, we, we've got all the gifts in operation. Ain't no way God can't bless us, boy. We are, we are spiritual. If you don't believe it, come to our service. Boy, we have a time. We sing, shout, raise hands. We, we, I mean, we blow it out. <laughs> and... And uh, about that time, AI turned on them and killed 36 of them. <laughs> and they come down the road singing, 
nobody knows the troubles I see. I thought I was spiritual. My whole reputation's ruined. I mean, I'm an evangelist and I'll never be able to face them people. Lord God, I thought I was walking with God. Let me tell you something, friends. The spirit-filled life is not exempt from failure. If you're afraid of failure, join something besides the church of the living God. And get out of the job. You're going to fail if you walk with God. You're going to have failures that's going to wipe you out. God's going to reduce you. God's going to bring you. Why? Why, if he let us go from victory to victory without making us dip into a valley, we'd be proud peacocks. Strutting our feathers, walking around here, saying, well, I wonder which one's got the best testimony today. Wonder who's going to sing the best, the Calvary singers or freedom. Wonder who's going to preach the best, Sonny, Paul, or Bill. We're com- or Jesse, we're coming for the show. We're going to see who can outdo the... Ladies and gentlemen, we're not here to compete and take sides. We're here to see the glory of God come. Lord, we need to hear from heaven. Lord, we need a touch of God. God, help us. We've got to have revival. And we can't have it with a crowd running around saying, Well, Brother Bill, I just think that we have sort of got it together. Baloney. Listen, Milldale is not where it is because it's a ooey-gooey, nasty-nasty, tooty-fruity lifestyle. Milldale is where it is because somebody stood in the middle of hell when the all flood tides were released and everything was topsy-turvy and everything was gone and the valley was deep and the clouds were, were covered over and they were having to fly on instruments. <laughs> Woo! Amen! And ladies and gentlemen, I know, I know that through the years, God's driven us to where we can't see a blooming thing. We're just watching the instruments. That's one thing I never could learn to do when I was trying. Well, I did fly uh, VFR, but when I was trying to get my instrument ratings and they put that hood on me, way out here, that hood goes way on you, and you can't fly by nothing but instruments. And you know when you're in when you're in weather socked in and you can't see, you'll think you're flying level if you depend on your senses. And the next thing you know, you th- I mean your your senses will be telling you you're level. <laughs> and all the time you're dipping a wing. And your senses are telling you it's all right. And all the time this wing's dipping until the first thing you know you're in a spin. And that's why some of these private planes hit the ground nose in and they go about that deep in the ground. What happened? They was going on their senses. Well, I think it's all right. Hey, there ain't nothing all right unless you're looking at the instruments. Because only Jesus looking to the captain. Amen? Are you listening to me? It's not what I think is right or wrong. It's what the book says. And so he got up there, and boy, they presumed everything was fine, no presumption. They assumed God's on them. Now, let me tell you something else. Just because God's on Milldale one conference don't mean he'll be on at the next conference. Don't you presume. Don't you. Listen, just because God's on Bill Stafford today don't mean he'll be on Bill Stafford down the road. It's according to my response to God. Amen. It's according to my response to God. The anointing of God's according to whether God can keep me. To bring glory and honor to His name and quit getting in the way of what God wants to do. Amen? The anointing of God is only for the person that brings glory to God and to God alone. Amen? 3,000 and they had to, they ran them. Oh, just take a few up there. After all, man, look what we've done before. Look what we have been. Boy, I hope. <laughs> Boy, if I ever settle down to what I have done, I hope you all are coming and hunt me up. I'm giving you the right to right now. Jimmy and Paul and Sonny, don't let Bill in on it. He'd enjoy it too much. <laughs> That's my son, by the way. But he favored his mama enough that he turned out pretty good looking. Amen. But I don't need no remarks on that, Okay. If I ever start glorying in the past on what I have been, I wish y'all would just hunt me up 
and just flog me like the Ku Klux used to do. <laughs> just tar and feather me. Amen? I mean, just ride me out of the town on a rail. Do something to humiliate me. Why? The greatest problem I face is wanting the glory in what I have been instead of looking to the future and what God will keep on doing if I just let God be God. Amen? Boy, I want to die with my preaching boots on. I mean, when they embalmed me, I want them to have to, I want to, have to tie down my jawbone from wanting to holler Jesus just one more time. Amen? We don't need many. We're pretty great folks. Jericho fell. Go up there and show them how to do it, boy. <laughs> boy, we got one, two, three, four. Three. Just follow the strategy. Number one, number two, number three, number four. After all, you know, we did it before. We can do it. Hey, don't you worry, buddy. You'll never get God in one, two, three, four. About the time you do, he'll move to five. And leave you hanging on four till you're a fool enough to seek him to get him, get on to five. Amen? Amen. Presumption. Hey, we don't need a whole lot. We're Baptists. We can always program it. If they won't come to visitation, intimidate them. Get up and name them. Force them to come. Boy, isn't that a real victory? Somebody dragging in, why are you here? Preacher said he's going to run me off if I didn't come. <laughs> well, you going visiting? Well, I don't feel like it, but I'm a going. And then he knocks on the door and hopes they're not there. Just hopes and prays they're not there. Folks, we're trying to push and motivate and pump and prime. Why can't we just get in the flow and let God be God and just enjoy Jesus? Just enjoy Jesus. Amen? Now, I actually got through... Enjoying his, or, or uh, hurt over the defeat, then comes pity. Pity. Lord, look what you've done. Don't you realize we're embarrassed? And God didn't say a word. God don't care if you're embarrassed. He just wants to know why did you get in such a mess to embarrass yourself. God didn't embarrass you. We've embarrassed ourselves. I was with a preacher the other day and he said, Lord God, Brother Bill said, we've got more people than we can handle. And God's put us in a predicament. We ain't got no money. And we got a bill. I said, well, boy, I'm sorry that God put you into something that he couldn't handle. Now, what he was really saying is, I don't really want to trust God and bring my people to a fresh dimension of faith. And what he was really saying, I'm afraid I'm going to have to trust God a little more and I'm just about ready to hang it up because <laughs> I'm afraid I'll get out there and be embarrassed. Hey, God, Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark. <laughs> I mean, he's serious. And he said, Lord, what did you bring us out here for this for? Uh, you mean you're going you're gonna to let us be a laughing stock? Or you mean to tell me you're going to let us lay out here and be an embarrassment? You mean you're not going to come through for us? And You mean, oh, I would to God, I never had God's Spirit filled. That's what he said. I don't believe you can stay in the Spirit filled life until you get sick of the Spirit filled life. I don't believe you can do anything for God till you get sick of what it is until nothing pleases but Jesus Christ and He become the source of everything in your life. Amen? Amen. What they had done, they got to the place, they thought, well, we, we've got this thing figured out, we got everything mechanical, we got everything calculated, and they were right on their merry way and missed God 50 miles and then tried to blame God for missing. I just wish I never had God's Spirit filled. This is Joshua. It's the man that just had two glorious miracles. You see, you can't build your life on miracles. What if God don't work one? I mean, amen? 
I mean, what if you come along and God works this miracle, brings you through that Red Sea, clabbers up those waters, and lets you walk through on dry land, and then all of a sudden He brings you through the Jordan and flood time, and then He lets you see the walls of Jericho come falling down? And then what if all of a sudden you say, Praise God, I'm believing God for this, and you tell everybody, and God lets you drop. What you going to do then? You see, what you do at that point reveals where you really are with God. Anybody can go on with God when they're all working. (laughs) Amen? Boy, look here. One, two, three, four. Boy, God just... Hey, God is. But I tell you what He will do. About that third one, when you think you have topped the last mountain and you are clipping the tops of the trees and you're about as spiritual as you can get, He'll just pull it all out from on you. Why? Why? So he can bring it back to God dependence. Man, I, I used to wonder why God did what he did in my life. I, I wondered if I was the sorriest preacher in the world. And I never knew many moments apart from storm. I remember somebody said one time, you're either in one, headed for one, or just came out of one. Well, Lord Jesus, I just wanted 24 hours between them. Lord, give me a little relief here. And come to find out, I didn't need relief. I need to get to Jesus. (laughs) Oh, Lord Jesus. I just wish I'd have been content to stay in Egypt. I don't want this kind of Christian life. God, they told me when I got spirit-filled, it's all over. I thought I'd arrive. They didn't tell me that you was going to pull the rug out from me and let me be embarrassed. You see, if you build your life on experiences, you're going to have to keep having more experiences to keep up with Jesus. And if you're not having an experience, you don't know God's around. Right? You see, what God's trying to teach you is how to walk with God when you can't touch Him, taste Him, smell Him, see Him, or hear Him. I mean, when the heavens are brass, your emotions are dead. I'm trying to tell people how to walk with God when you don't feel Him. How to walk with God when you can't see Him. How to walk with God when you can't smell Him. How to walk with God when you can't touch Him. How to walk with God when all hell. I mean, listen, folks, it's not what I feel that's right. It's what God says that's right. And what God's trying to do is stop me from walking in my feelings and learn how to walk by faith in the Word of God. And if I get my faith right, my feelings will be right. Amen. You say, well, boy, I think it's awful God do that. I don't think it is. I think it's a good process to bring us to the glory of God and total dependence upon Him. Who minds a few failures after you've seen a Jericho wall come down and the Red Sea clabbered up and the Jordan crossed over and then you're going to see more victories down the road? Canaan doesn't mean that you're not going to have war and you're not going to have failures. Canaan means if you walk with God, He's going to be everything. Well, then come the purging. God said, Joshua, what you praying about? Ain't no time to pray. I can't hear prayer when sin's in the camp. I can't hear you pray when greed's dominating your life. I can't hear you pray when you're harboring self-sins like bitterness and resentment. I can't hear you pray when you're greedy and selfish and tight and won't give. I can't hear you. I can't hear you pray when your temper's out of control and you've made people irritable and mad and you've hurt feelings. I can't hear you pray when you're critical. I can't hear you pray whenever your life is dominated by self-pity and self-adulation and self-glory and touchy. Opinionated, judgmental. I can't hear you pray when you walk in as if you're indispensable. I've seen people in churches that sat on the deacon board so long they thought that nothing could happen till they got there. 
Amen. I'm sort of slowing her down now because I feel like we're at a point to where we're going to have to have some purging. Amen. And God said, get up off your face and quit praying. There's sin in the camp. Oh, my Lord. I haven't done nothing. Oh, but wait just a minute. Aiken has, and collectively you're all responsible. Boy, and that brings us down to body life. Body life. Boy, we belong to each other. One part of my member cannot hurt without it all hurting. One part of me cannot be paralyzed without it affecting my whole body. Amen? One part of me can't be inoperative without the rest of the body of being affected. Right? I never knew what real body life was till I was going through the house one day and stumped my middle toe on a chair leg. And ladies and gentlemen, my toes had not had any attention for years. I didn't pay them any attention. I just washed them, put my socks over, nobody sees them. I just don't, I don't put perfume on them and I don't, I don't, I don't do it. Why? Nobody sees them. I mean, how many of us want to have a foot showing tonight? I mean, we just don't do that. You know, toe, toes on top of toes, bunions, corns, and, amen, long toes, short toes, ingrowing toenails. I mean, who wants to sit here tonight and say, let's have a toe showing? But I want you to know when my wife came in and saw me in the middle of the floor rolling around, holding my stomach, crying like a baby, she said, Honey, do you, are you having an attack of appendicitis? I said, No, I stumped my toe. She said, Why are you holding your stomach? I said, Because I can't tell where all I am are hurting. <laughs> Amen. Man, I've been holding that. Well, you know, well. Lord, you know, you're, you're just trying, everything's haywire over just one little toe. Why? You can't separate life. It's all the same. The toe, the head, the nose, the eye, the ear. That's why God so put us together. So that we can't function are isolated from others. We are dependent on each other to function for the glory of God where God's put us. Amen. Well, all night long I laid that foot up on a pillow and that middle toe said, pay attention, pay attention. Every time my heart had beat, my middle toe would say, pay attention. I was laying there and said, I am! And he got attention. My whole body responded to the problem. I'm asking Jesus, whatever kind of purging is necessary to bring us to revival, God purges until we can't exist without hearing from God. And I want you to know, God said, I tell you what, you want, what I want you to do. I want you all to up and sanctify yourself tomorrow. Get cleansed before God. I want you to confess your sins. I want you to come before me clean. I want you to get right with me. Sanctify. Separate. I mean, I want holiness. And then as a result of holiness, I want you to take Achan and his whole family. And I want you to take them out there and literally cut them off. And God told them to kill the whole crowd. And they took them outside and killed Achan and his wife and children. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is awful heavy. And I, I don't know why God just had me down this alley. But I am under the firm conviction that if we don't come to a point of hungering for holiness, holiness, Right standing with God. 